Uh, cool. Welcome to our talk. Uh, we are Eugene and Stu uh, from Twitter. While I was away, you met Stu. That's really cool. And uh, uh, today we'll be discussing our vision for semantic tooling uh, that we're implementing at Twitter and that we're developing in the open so that everyone in the community can use it. Uh, okay. Just uh, a really brief outline of the talk. Uh, first of all, we will go through the challenges uh, that uh, we at Twitter face uh, with uh, our code base that spans uh, millions of lines of code, how we solve them, and uh, what's still to be done. Afterwards, uh, we will present our thoughts of uh, uh, what kind of uh, standards uh, we should have for tooling, what kind of you know bar we should have uh, for the applications that uh, help us work with code. And uh, finally, uh, we will go uh, through the details of the technology stack that we propose uh, to solve the problems and to improve upon state of the art. Uh, all right. And if, and if you have any questions at any point, let us know so we can have a little more interactive experience. So uh, my last scholar days was um, in Amsterdam, which was fantastic. A um, few things have changed since then, but a whole bunch of stuff has not. Uh, Twitter's definitely still in a monorepo. Um, it's still called Source with a capital S. Um, the build is massively more consistent and slightly faster. Um, all of the other nice properties of monorepos still exist. Um, there has been a persistent rumor that Twitter is writing less Scala, but it's just utterly not true. Um, and even since JDK 8 landed in our monorepo about a year ago, um, the Scala code base grew by 35% and the Java code base grew by 19%. So, yeah, that's that's a, an, an excellent endorsement of Scala. Um, <clears throat> who here knows what a monorepo is? Cool. Who here is working in a monorepo primarily? Pretty small. Oh, well, yeah, we have, we have a few folks. Okay, um, monorepos. I, I I kind of lead the monorepo show, I suppose. Um, the Benefits of monorepos can be summarized pretty quickly in um, not having dependency diamonds, being able to atomically commit across projects, um, i.e. update a library and the consumer of that library at once, um, uh, have top to bottom continuous integration testing, not just on you know, snapshots of things, but any, any commit in any repo, you can, you can then test against all of its dependencies. Um, you also get a linear change history, meaning that you can get bisect to exactly the change that broke you, um, rather than essentially bisecting to the major version bump of one of your dependencies and then not knowing, um, not knowing what portion of that change. Um, That's a unique experience. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, st I'll stand over here for a second. Um, and you have no binary incompatibilities between depths except at the boundary. Um, that's really just an argument for source distributions, and you can kind of see that in the Rust and uh, um, the Rust and, and Node communities that source distributions have kind of allowed for this really great uh, library story. But outside of source distributions, binary distributions are a pain, huge pain. Um, so, but achieving the promise of a monorepo. Am I now on this? Uh, achieving the promise of a monorepo um, requires a lot of tooling. Uh, so I've given previous talks about pants, multiple talks. Um, I've also talked about dependency hygiene, um, which is kind of knowing your dependencies, uh, allowing for lots of dependencies, not rewriting code that you don't need to rewrite, um, but knowing the cost of dependencies. Uh, and today we'll talk a little bit more about semantic tooling um, and the role that plays in a monorepo. Um, and outside of one as well. Um, so at Twitter, uh, the day, a day in the life of a core lib dev uh, is pretty good. Um, there's coffee uh, and free lunch and a roof deck and all that good stuff. Um, but also, when you commit something, you, or I'm sorry, pre-merge, you get pre-merge unit and integration testing of all of your dependents. So you make some change to a library. It's kind of like everyone having the, community, the, the Scala community build um, at their fingertips, uh, rebuild everything that depends on me, um, 
I get all of the code coverage of all my dependencies. And so if anyone has bothered to write a particular test, you know, I, I, I don't end up committing broken code. And I do that atomically, which is great too. Um, there are thousands of examples of people using my, my API. Um, I can go in and fiddle with those if somebody's doing it wrong. Um, and the users sit down right, right down the hall. That's all good. Um, but it's not perfect. So given that there's tons of source code, um, how do I remove an API? So monorepos, in theory, give you the ability to avoid deprecations in the common case. Because you can edit both the library and the thing that depends on it, um, you can just straight up uh, make method renames, things like that, um, without deprecating the old method and then uh, and going through a deprecation cycle there. Um, also, dead code in a monorepo is not like dead code in a polyrepo setup. So if some, some dead repo out some, I'm sorry, if some repo out somewhere uh, is depending on a library, you don't ever really have to touch it. You don't ever really have to integrate with that, that, uh, that repo. Um, and so you don't ever have to really update that code. Um, in a monorepo, everything builds all the time and, and can't bit rot uh, unless it's been straight up deleted. Um, so as an example, internally, we, we wanted to rewrite future.get to await result. Um, and this is Twitter's future, but I think in, uh, in this particular case, this was something to align more closely with the Scala futures. Um, and, and it required a custom compiler plugin, and that's not the, great, the best situation. Um, they also accomplished it as multiple, multiple commits. Um, although that was not strictly, strictly necessary. So let's talk about the state of semantic tooling. We'd like that to be better, first of all. Um, we have very coarse uh, semantic information via target level dependencies. There are a lot of targets. Um, and then there's a smaller number of roots. So if you have targets, sorry, targets in pants terminology are modules. SPT projects is another way to think about them, but we, we focus on having a very, very small amount of configuration for every particular, any particular target. Um, and in particular, over the course of the last few years, uh, the amount of config required to define a target um, has dropped significantly in that you no longer have to name them if you want the name to just default to the directory they're in, and you no longer have to uh, specify what sources they match um, if you want kind of the default set of sources. And so you really just end up listing your dependencies and nothing else to define some new module. Um, and so given that it's now so easy, there are lots of targets. Um, people split targets up and you have, you know, two files per target in some cases. Um, the roots then are things that test those targets or are binaries for those targets or are published. So if you have, if, you, if you've marked something as having semver um, that's also a root. Uh, we also have slightly finer, like class level semantic information, which we get from Zinc. Um, and so there are a lot of class files. Uh, I have a bit of inconsistency here. That's a post, post code gen number. Um, whereas pre code gen lines of code, um, we have very fast text and regex based indexes, but it's not quite semantic information yet. Um, the only place where we have symbol level information, unfortunately, um, is where almost everyone has it, which is in IDEs. Um, we had a very old source graph install, and unfortunately it was recently deprecated. Um, it was kind of legacy code for both companies. Uh, it relied on a particular compiler version, um, which will kind of become a theme here. Um, and also it was specific to source graph. Uh, they have a great new direction, and I'm very optimistic that uh, they will do well there. I'm not ruling out continuing to collaborate with them. So uh, I think actually the LSP is extensions, language server protocol, Microsoft language server protocol, as Martin mentioned, is also being used in Dottie. So that's, that's definitely promising. Um, Pants also has recently gained support for Scalafix and has had support for Scala FMT for a while. Um, they're not widely used yet internally, uh, but we'll probably do, you know, as one commit, a very large rewrite of, of all of the code fairly soon. Um, to get everything consistent. So we'd like to be in a better place, and we have some ideas about that, um, which is what we'll talk about next. OK. Uh, so once we realized the problem, 
how that is that uh, the uh, semantic tooling is a bit like him because well, we, we have something similar to grab, it's more advanced, it's faster, but still it's not enough for you know, complete understanding of the code base. And then we went ahead and, uh, well, together with uh, the developers at our company, we figured uh, what are the main requirements for them to be effective. And, well, basically, the first thing that uh, we'd like to do with the code is uh, to understand it. Because, well, we read code much uh, more often than we write it. And as a result, it would be really cool if we could provide a system uh, that uh, resolves names in programs that uh, people write. So that we can do the proverbial, you know, command click, control click, navigate to definition. And then we could do even more. So for instance, for classes, we could figure out the inheritance relationship, uh, relationships between them. Uh, we could uh, fetch documentation and do a lot of cool stuff once we have uh, the information that the compiler has about the code. Also, code review is a very important part of our workflow and everyone's workflow, basically. And uh, for a given change, for a given patch, a pull request, we would like to, well, first of all, have the diagnostics from the compiler and also to also be able to, to go uh, to use hyperlinking so that uh, we can easily navigate the pull request and understand what it's about, about its concept, context. Another very important thing, after we hacked up the code, we reviewed it and then we pushed it, uh, what do we do with it next? So this is something that uh, Stu has alluded to in the previous part of the presentation. In a, mono, in a mono repo, that's especially important because uh, if the dead code is there, it's always compiling. So for every change, for every pull request that is submitted, we compile it over and over again. And it would be nice uh, to have ways to deal with that because that will speed up our builds. And well, as you guys uh, very well know, uh, Scala C compilation times, uh, this is somewhat of uh, an unsolved problem. And also speaking of code evolution, there's a very promising direction, uh, aut automated rewritings. So Stu also mentioned Scalafix, and uh, that's, uh, I think, the step in the right direction. So how do we make sure that Scalafix uh, scales to huge code bases like ours? That's another challenge, and that's something that we're tackling. Okay, uh, so how do we do that? Because uh, it's, uh, it's great to do uh, this kind of uh, wishful thinking, but what kind of technology can we use to pull this off? And uh, I think we need to do this uh, three-step solution. Uh, first of all, we need a reliable way to extract uh, semantic information from the compiler. So the compiler is the guy who knows everything about our code, so let's just talk directly to Scala C and then, uh, well, fetch uh, the information about resolved names for hyperlinking, about inheritance relationships, documentation, and so on and so forth. That's the first part. And then, uh, well, for huge code bases like ours, uh, we also need some sort of distributed tooling that would uh, take this information that we fetched and then store it in a scalable manner so that it can then be served to power the third step, uh, that is the ecosystem of tools. For instance, code rewritings, like Scalafix, code analysis, code search, uh, and these tools would work with the schemas that we've extracted and, uh, well, with this big distributed storage uh, that we provide. And uh, the first step uh, for extraction is based on the project that I started at the PFL while I still was a PhD student uh, several years ago. Uh, the project is called Scala Meta. You probably heard about it, but in a bit of a different context. Uh, so let's uh, go a little bit through the functionality that Scala Meta provides. I like to group uh, the functionality into two big categories. Uh, the first one is uh, what we call syntactic API. It basically allows you to parse the code, to tokenize it, well, basically to see what the code is made of, uh, but not to understand its meaning. This is something that uh, has been pretty stable. It's available for several year years already, and it was part of our 1.0 release that we did in Berlin at Scala Days last year. And now for a newer addition, something that we call a semantic API, uh, this is what I hacked after, uh, after I joined Twitter uh, last year. And uh, the semantic API is exactly the solution for the problem that we outlined before uh, of talking to uh, the Scala compiler and then uh, fetching the semantic information about the code. Uh, we intentionally built this as an open source project, so this uh, nothing closed source going on at all. So, uh, and uh, 
well, you can go to the Scala Meta repository, Scala Meta slash Scala Meta at GitHub, and check our recent progress issues, so on and so forth. And uh, why we're doing that? Uh, because we're really sure that we need uh, some sort of a community-wide standard here so that uh, people don't, don't need to reinvent the wheel over and over again. So uh, it's not just uh, you know, some pipe dream. It's actually a project that's used uh, internally at Twitter. And uh, we also collaborate with the Scala Center on the Scala Fix tool uh, that uses our newly introduced semantic API. And uh, also, we have a stable release, 1.8. Uh, that features a technology pre preview of uh, the semantic API, something that I will talk about a little bit later, and I will show a couple examples how exactly it works. And so uh, it's, uh, it's all very good and interesting, uh, but I guess uh, most of you heard of Scala Meta in the context of macros, and that's how the project uh, started. So back then, in 2011, when I just joined the PFL and had this idea to implement macros for Scala, uh, we were using Scala Reflect, uh, that is the thin API over compiler internals in order to do compile time meta programming. But over years we realized that uh, that doesn't cut it because being tied to compiler internals, it, uh, it's not good for portability. And then at that time we already knew internally in the lab uh, that there will be a new Scala compiler, an experimental one. Maybe it would become Scala 3 and now indeed it has the potential and it's been announced that Dottie will be Scala 3. So we needed to do something better, something portable. And this is how Scala Meta was born. And so as a, as a matter of fact, the project that started with these simple origins, it's now grown into something much bigger. Uh, general, generally the uh, foundation for tools in Scala. So as a result, uh, today in this very talk, I will be covering only the tooling phase of Scala Meta. We also have some really great exciting progress on the macro side. So just uh, yesterday I finished the prototype of def macros. So we had macro annotations a uh, long time ago, a year ago in New York City at Scala Days. But now we also have def macros. And that's a very, very cool development. I'm uh, definitely happy about this. I've been hacking nonstop for quite a while. And I will talk more about that at the, uh, uh, at the upcoming talk in, in, just, uh, in just an hour or two. Uh, that, that will be called Scala Meta Coding Session. So Pathocrit, he kindly agreed, the, the speaker, he kindly agreed that I hijack the session a little bit and show our recent progress. Anyway, uh, without further ado, let's see how Scala Meta helps us with tooling, helps us to do semantic tooling, this vision that we mentioned before. Uh, well, first of all, we need to understand the background. How does the tooling story look right now? So what's the state of the art? And uh, as a matter of fact, it's not easy. So in order to integrate with the Scala compiler, in, a, in order to get full information about your code, you need to write compiler plugins. And then after, after you write a compiler plugin, you insert it after this phase called typer, which is the type checker. Then you import something called the global, basically the compiler, which contains uh, you know, hundreds of methods. You start fighting with it because you instantaneously get overwhelmed. Well, what, what do you do? <laughs> what, what method do you pick to achieve your particular goal? And finally, well, the battle is over. Maybe you uh, figured out some Stack Overflow answers by Travis Brown, who's been doing the same for you when macros just got introduced. And finally, you're done. But actually, you're not done, because next time when a minor version of the compiler is released, well, Lightband guys maybe refactor something in order to make the compiler simpler and faster, and then suddenly the API is gone, so what do you do? And well, that's the sad life of a semantic tool developer. Uh, why does this approach not work? Uh, well, something that, uh, due to the reasons that I mentioned before. First of all, the uh, sources of the compiler are huge. It's uh, tens of thousands lines of code. Maybe with, uh, with all the tests, it would be over 100,000. And naturally, it contains a lot of modules, and uh, they call each other. And they also work with the common API, which is thousands of methods. That's not fun, and uh, that's not easy to get into. So back then in 2011, when we were designing an API for macros, we actually figured, well, while we're doing compile time metaprogramming, maybe we can reuse the same API for tooling. So let's just uh, reduce the API surface to several hundred most popular methods, and then we will try to do with it. Maybe, maybe that'll be enough. So now I realize when I'm looking uh, at the slide, it says, well, several hundred methods in an API. Oh my god, this is insane. Right, but uh, at that time, if we get one slide back, 
which says thousands of different methods, that's definitely an improvement by you know, one or two orders of magnitude. So that was quite a breakthrough, honestly, because uh, we not only simplified the API, but we also guaranteed stability of this API between minor versions and minor releases of Scala, and even major ones. So when we uh, went from Scala to 10 to Scala to 11, we actually did a lot of work to provide source compatibility for the migration. So actually, some APIs got renamed, got moved, but uh, there were ways to cross-compile. So it wasn't, maybe it wasn't pretty, but it was still working, which is, uh, which is I guess, quite interesting in comparison with the API that can break across minor versions. And uh, afterwards, we did the second attempt. Uh, in order to make better macros, this is how Scala Meta was started. We were interested in further reducing the API uh, surface. And then we you know, did another order of magnitude improvement and compressed the surface of APIs using uh, some technologies that you may have heard of, quasi-codes. So Dennis, uh, the author of quasi-codes, is here in the audience. And other know-hows, we basically came up with ways to simplify things. Uh, but one thing that was uh, still in there, we were talking to the compiler. So we were using compilers underlying data structures uh, via this approach which we called converters. So basically we had dedicated modules uh, that uh, convert from Scala, uh, Scala C trees to uh, Scala meta trees back and forth. So that was uh, quite an interesting experience. And unfortunately we, well it didn't work, long story short. Research is fun and uh, well, Personally, I, most, I enjoy the failed projects because you learn so much. So <laughs> why did this one fail? Uh, well, first of all, we were still relying on Scala C internals. And uh, well, they're quite complicated. So compiler needs to do a lot of stuff. Not just, uh, you know, equivalent uh, of semantic tooling, but also bytecode generation. Also transformations that lower your high level Scala code into low level JVM bytecode. And uh, for that, the data model is much more complicated than we needed. And as a result, the converters that I was uh, mentioning before, they were thousands of lines of code. And they were quite uh, tricky to get right in the first place. And uh, you know, when you need to be really smart to write some code, you need to be twice as smart to debug it. And <clears throat> well, I'm not that smart. So we essentially scrapped this approach and uh, came up with something better in the beginning of this year. Uh, so what we thought, we thought that we would rethink the data structures completely from scratch. Uh, so uh, we went ahead, figured out the use cases that we wanted to support, and created a data schema that works just for that. So since we don't need to compile anything to bytecode, we just need to understand meanings of programs so that we can write smarter tools. We've come up with a thing that does only this, so for instance, for a given identifier, we can now store unique IDs of uh, definitions that it points to. Also, if we need uh, to remember a compiler message, a compiler warning, well, we have a compiler warning data structure in the API. Something like this. And as a result, we didn't have to do any bidirectional interop with the compiler anymore. So uh, uh, this has simplified the API even further. I would say another order of magnitude improvement. Uh, how does this look like? Well, the data schema that we introduced, uh, we gave it a name, a special name called semantic database. And uh, uh, the simplicity can be proven by just you know, lines of code. So we encode the uh, data schema in a protobuf uh, definition and then just a little bit more than 50 lines of code in the current version of Scala Meta. And even though it's quite minimalistic, it already supports a lot of functionality. So it allows uh, to resolve names, to store compiler warnings, uh, to store something called denotations, which is basically signatures and flags for definitions. So for instance, if a method is implicit, then this denotation thing, it remembers that it's implicit. And uh, finally, we store something called syntactic sugars, which is basically uh, whatever the type checker infers about your programs, be it type arguments, uh, term arguments, such as uh, implicit parameters, and so on and so forth. And finally, we went ahead and implemented a prototype of this as a compiler plugin. So actually we have a compiler plugin uh, that can integrate into Scala 2.11 and Scala 2.12, and then talk to the compiler and dump this information that uh, data mines into the semantic DB protobuf schema. Uh, now, 
let, uh, let me go through a quick example that would show the capabilities of what's in there already in the Scala Meta 1.8 release. Uh, we will go ahead and uh, see a very simple Scala file. It's not very meaningful, but it demonstrates a lot of features. And so we will see what kind of semantic database we can get for this program. Let's do some live coding because this always works. All right, I'll start with the promised file. Uh, let's just tune the font. Uh, guys at the last rows, is this legible or I need to increase it further? It's all right? Okay, cool. I can see it definitely. Uh, okay, so this is the program that we've seen on the slide. And now I'm just gonna drop into the command line and uh, compile this file. All right. As I mentioned, uh, we have a custom compiler plugin and it's quite un uh, unwieldy to just say, you know, X plugin, blah, 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 provide a full path. So for my Scala C script, I actually have this custom flag called semantic DB. And uh, if you compile this library.scala file with this uh, compiler invocation, it's gonna, you know, wait for a while. Maybe we need Scala native to make it faster so that it uh, doesn't have to jit everything from scratch. And after the compilation finishes, uh, next uh, to the class files, which are there in the com directory, uh, we also see the meta inf directory. So meta inf scala meta. Well, this made sense to me definitely, so I just decided to go for it. <laughs> and uh, afterwards, in the meta inf directory, we have something called semantic DB. So if we go there, uh, we will see that uh, there's a file called library.semanticdb. So for every file that we compile, there's a corresponding semantic DB thing in this meta inf. So we, we generate one file uh, per one input file in order to support SBT and incremental compilation. Just like, you know, Scala.js or Scala native do that. And if we take a look in this, inside the semantic DB, we're not gonna see anything fun because it's a uh, protobuf, but actually it'll give some idea. So some bin binary data plus strings, well, not very interesting. Let's go back and uh, actually use a, a script, a helper script that I wrote using the Scala Meta API. So Scala Meta provides an object model that allows you to load this uh, binary schemas into well inspectable objects. And uh, uh, let's, uh, let's take a look. I need some magic invocations because it's a pretty rough script, but you can actually write something like that yourself or we have SBT integration. Don't ask me why we need to provide two arguments. That's just, well, weird. What's interesting is the output of the script that it'll provide. Anyway, let's go through the printout section by section. Uh, well, first of all, we see that uh, this uh, particular uh, file, it was generated from library.scala, which is pretty expected. And then it has uh, something called a dialect. So uh, in Scala Meta, we use dialects to signify compiler versions so that we know the difference. Uh, well, because different compiler versions have different semantics, so this is definitely useful. And here we compiled everything with uh, Scala 2.11 because that's what my script in this particular directory is using. And now we get to something more interesting uh, to the first section uh, called names. And in this section for every identifier in the file so you can see com, example, printer, so on and so forth, we have a unique identifier of the definition that it points to. So for instance, we know that a string is actually, comes from pre-def. And uh, we also know that print line it's also a pre-def method, and so on and so forth. So you may notice uh, that methods have uh, uh, JVM signatures here, and that's because uh, this is how the Scala compiler internally distinguishes between overloads. Because multiple methods can have the same name, you also need uh, to provide signatures as a part of this unique ID. And uh, well, at one of the presentations, someone asked what do these numbers mean? So these numbers basically uh, specify a range uh, for, for a particular identifier. So this uh, class printer, the printer thing, it starts at the 27th character and it ends at the 34th. So that's, uh, that's this section. And now let's go to denotations. Uh, let's make it a bit higher. Uh, as I mentioned before, denotations, they provide signatures and flags, basically information about definitions. Uh, here, for instance, we can see the companion object example that we define on the line nine in library.scala. And since objects are implicitly final, we see that, uh, well, there's the final flag in the data schema. 
And uh, well, what's cool about these denotations is that uh, they know everything about the information that the Scala C itself has. So for instance, uh, we even have the info about the primary constructor that has been generated for the class printer. Even though you don't write it explicitly, Scala compiler still generates it, and so it's useful to know about that. All right, uh, now on to more features. As I mentioned before, uh, semantic databases, they can actually store compiler warnings. And let's uh, demonstrate this. Uh, let's uh, introduce an unused import in our program, and then we will recompile, uh, recompile, regenerate the semantic DB using the warn unused import flag. It'll take a little bit again, and we will see the warning. Now if we inspect the uh, semantic database, using this magic invocation that I provided before, we will see that we have the messages section now, which again provides a range position that is a start and an end for this particular warning. And so warnings, like, uh, so in, in this case, uh, the range position will be pointing to list that goes from 34 to 38. And that's quite neat because later we can exploit this information in different tools. I'll talk, uh, I'll talk about this just a little later. And finally, something that I mentioned before as well, so semantic DB supports syntactic sugars, uh, that is uh, implicit arguments. So for instance, uh, recently uh, we had uh, a great post, a blog post from the Scala Center on the scalalang.org, which talked about the collection redesign. And one of the points uh, that was discussed there is uh, we have this can build from thing in uh, the current collections. So some people consider it to be well cryptic and well, there are ways to simplify the collection API in order to deal with this somehow. So let's see how the semantic DB can illustrate this. Uh, let's start with a simple list, which is now one to three, uh, that maps the elements and basically adds a one to them. Again, let's uh, recompile the semantic database and, uh, well, spoiler alert, we'll get a new section that will show off this uh, can build from thing. We're gonna read the semantic DB, and uh, here we go. This is the section called sugars, syntactic sugars, uh, that actually says uh, quite a lot about the original program. Let me try to, oops. Let me try to show you the original code as well. Okay, here we go. So we have this list one, two, three that does the map. And uh, we see the bunch of information that has, has been inferred about the program. Well, first of all, at an offset 105, which is basically after the identifier list, we see that the Scala compiler has inferred int as a type argument. And we also see that at uh, 118, which is after map, Scala compiler has inferred two type arguments, int and any, whatever that is. And uh, finally, uh, there's an implicit argument in play called can build from. So what's that? Let's just take a really quick look at the definition of list.scala. And we will see well this you know, uh, famous signature for map, which actually not only takes the function, but it also takes an implicit parameter that does something. So I won't be going into details of uh, how this mechanism works. Uh, you can take a look at the blog post at scalang.org. But basically what's cool about the semantic DB is that it knows all these things uh, about your code base because that's what Scala C knows. And then it exposes this information in a way that's accessible to tools. Okay, uh, now back to the slides. Uh, even though the semantic DB technology it only exists for a couple months, it already has early adopters. And uh, what we found out is that the really stupid data schema, it makes uh, things hackable. So previously, when we just started with Scala Reflect, I remember people needed a lot of guidance. Well, because Scala Reflect was basically an API into com compiler internals. But now with semantic DBs, it's much easier. Uh, I saw people who hacked up some stuff by themselves, just you know, uh, parsing the semantic DB files when there still were text, and then coming to Gitter and telling us, well, look, we did some stuff. And uh, people did some really, really crazy things, but that didn't matter because they, they could get their job done, which I find to be pretty impressive. So I think we, we've struck a, a very good balance between simplicity and comprehensiveness, and we're really looking forward to explore this further. One super quick example that I still want to show uh, before giving the stage back to Stu <laughs> is uh, Scalafix. 
So Scalafix is a tool that's developed uh, by Olaf from the Scala Center in order to do code migrations. And uh, this, is, uh, this has been a very prolific collaboration I'll actually... Uh, Thank you, Olaf. <laughs> let's do that. And so uh, what, uh, what Olaf recently added just several days ago uh, to Scalafix is the capability to remove unused imports. So actually, if you compile your code base with the semantic DB enabled, uh, then you can go ahead and launch Scalafix, which within a couple of seconds, because it doesn't have to recompile your code base, it just has to read the info in the semantic databases. It can uh, produce diffs like this. So let's hope that GitHub works now, as opposed to yesterday. So it does. And actually, you can see super, super nice automatically produced refactor, which look really legible. Quite awesome. And you have loads of lots of stuff. So basically, for every import that the Scala compiler reports as unused, and the Scala compiler has the ultimate knowledge here because it knows everything about your programs. Uh, we then store this information in semantic DBs, and then Scalafix can use it to remove the imports that are unused. That's pretty neat. And what I find personally very impressive about uh, this transformation is that it looks like as if the human did that. So we don't reformat anything, we don't introduce you know extraneous indentation or stuff like this. Looks uh, very good. And I can use it from Vim. Yes, and Stu can use it from Vim. <laughs> How cool is this? Well, uh, thanks all. Of Okay, Stu, please go ahead. Yes. So the next bit of this vision is uh, being able to do this at scale, um, outside of an IDE in particular. Um, we would like this to be language agnostic. Um, and as Eugene mentioned, like the Scala Meta is a very, very powerful API for, for Scala, and it has a very simple schema, and that's very beneficial. I'm gonna talk about something that has a much more complicated schema um, for reasons. Uh, Kite. Kite is a Google project, um, Google open source project. Uh, it came out of their internal code search tool, Grok. Um, uh, what is it? It's a common interchange um, and schema for semantic information about code. In particular, it's a schema for a, a semantic graph. Um, it contains all kinds of things like symbol definitions and references, call graph. Uh, it can represent a call graph. Um, uh, it can represent inheritance relationships, generic templated type information for multiple languages. Um, and in particular, it's a scalable semantic index graph. Um, how many different types of relationships? Like how different is it from Scala Meta schema wise? It's pretty different. Um, it has a lot of different, so this is the concatenation of edge types and node types in this semantic graph. Um, and it continues. Um, so yeah, it's a schema for a graph, and then that graph is going to store information about code, um, it is a, and, and then the graph is also, therefore, an index by a whole bunch of different properties that you might want to uh, examine about your code. Um, these visualizations were dumped out of the open source Kaith, uh schema format by uh, a visualization that um, Benji Weinberger uh, worked on, and I'll talk about that later. Um, so the value proposition of Kite in particular is that you get this hub and spoke model where you uh, write a tool once um, that can then work across multiple languages. Um, additionally, you write uh, a compiler integration or, in our case, a Scala Meta integration um, to, to uh, analyze code and, and, and import it to a Kite schema. Um, it's multi-language, multi-platform, uh, part of that hub there. Um, they're in progress implementations for, for uh, Scala, in fact. We'll talk about that in a second. Supports very large graphs. Um, the index for the Chromium repo is about 50 gigabytes, which is totally, totally manageable on one machine, even. Um, and from Twitter's perspective, we immediately have multi language support as a goal um, because Java and Scala are on this, the same platform. Um, moreover, Thrift and Pro Protobuf are sort of. Uh, on that same platform, right? You'd want, you'd want to be able to not look at the generated code um, when, when you jump to a definition, right? Um, the generated code is not that interesting. There's plenty of it. Um, and it all looks the same. So the language agnostic tooling, um, question mark, can we actually achieve language agnostic tooling? Do things like um, 
like the, the types of rewrites that Olaf has mentioned across all of the languages that you support? Who knows? Um, but to start with, there are some things included out of the box. Um, there is, there's a simple server to host all of this information and an API. Um, you can execute complex graph queries with various graph databases. Um, it has a pretty simple but powerful CLI tool. Uh, it supports import and export as triples, quads, um, and C tags. So export as C tags is definitely useful immediately. Um, they have out of the box call graph analyses so you can um, kind of see which, which code paths are entering into a particular method um, and has a toy code browser UI. Um, so things that might be possible, maybe you could do a generic documentation browser and then you don't need both Javadoc and Scaladoc, you have a generic documentation browser, cool. Um, you could do code analytics to determine how many, many different call paths uh, reach a particular call site, um, or sorry, particular method. Um, in theory, you could maybe do completely generic incremental compilation, that would be amazing. Um, and you also, in theory, could do dead code elimination. So something's completely not reachable from any of those routes I mentioned before, and therefore it's dead. We would love that. Um, so we've been working on adding Scala support to Kaif. Um, it is the most functional of the supported languages, um, but it's similarly abstraction rich to C++, which was their first language, um, which also supports higher kind of types. Um, one difference, though, is that this will be the first the first uh, multi, um, multiple languages on the same platform example within, within Kyth, um, because they haven't actually done things like, although they support Go and they support C++, they haven't supported cross-referencing from Go to C++, um, for example. Um, we've started this. Uh, I'm gonna use that same example that Eugene had, um, and I'm gonna walk through what putting it in Kyth looks like. Um, Using the Scala host compiler plugin, uh, which your build tool will definitely just plug in for you. Um, you will build some code. Uh, you will use our tool to emit kith entries, um, which are essentially those quads. Are, they're essentially quads, edges in the graph. Um, and the result is a graph, again. Um, so let's walk through an example of what is in that graph. Um, we're, sorry, we're gonna be going uh, counterclockwise from, from the right-hand side here. Um, so a function is a child of a class. Uh, kite edge child of is the type of the edge, um, and it points to a record uh, subkind class. Okay, that's a class. Um, and that class has a function. The type of the function is uh, kind function, has this, this long signature that, that Eugene demonstrated. Um, something calls that function, okay, so it's a kite edge ref call. Um, the caller of the function is an anchor, um, uh, so it's a particular position in the code. So you, this is enough to actually get at a call graph, right, um, by saying that this, this, this anchor is a child of some other function. Um, so it is possible for this, this function to call that function uh, at this position. Um, that function, now taking, walking off of that call graph and just down a different path in the semantic graph. Um, so a lot of serendipity in semantic graphs. Um, has a parameter named args, um, and it is the zeroth parameter of the function. Um, parameters are variables. They're, uh, they have a subkind of local, um, and it has a unique, unique name, again, straight out of the semantic DB. Um, the type of that parameter is a type application, um, kite edge typed uh, tap of two parameters, array and string, built-ins. Um, cool, and so you apply that and you get array string. Neat, um, that's a lot of information. This is really just the start of what's possible here. So we, we implemented Scala Meta Kite. Um, it uses the Scala Meta API to emit kite entries. Um, it will be open source soon. Um, but yeah, it uses the Scala Meta Mirror API, uh, which is very easy to use. Uh, it walks through the Scala Meta AST and consumes the symbols and denotations that he mentioned um, to emit kite entries. And there's a lot more work to do. 
So obviously we're gonna integrate Kite with Pants. There is already some, some direct support for, for indexing Java code um, using Pants into Kite. Uh, thanks again to Benji Weinberger for that part. But we imagine a whole bunch of other, other integrations. Um, in particular, uh, well, making indexing super trivial um, directly from the build tool. So in your CI, you could imagine running Pants uh, to hit a particular Kite API server, populate, populate that Kite API server with um, the latest build, um, or send it to a distributed file system to aggregate, or who knows. But also interesting is maybe you could run a Kite query and then Scala fix anything that matched it. Um, because as fast as Scala fix is, even with native, uh, it would, would take a non-trivial amount of time to run on the entire code base um, or on the entire Scala community build. So first filter out to, what, to the relevant bits um, and then execute. So Kite is gonna be interesting just because it's this massively complicated thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it's very general. And so while a lot of tooling is going to be, is just immediately possible, I can, I can tell you that a documentation browser will absolutely be possible. Uh, call graph analysis should, should just be possible. Um, things like rewrites are probably going to require all of the knowledge that Scala Meta has um, at any given point in time to, to execute. And, uh, and so there will always be room for more language-specific tools. But I think if we can push further in that direction of generic tooling, it will be a very interesting frontier. So Eugene. OK. Uh, thanks, Sue. That was very exciting. Uh, now to sum it up, uh, what we heard and uh, what we talked about today. We think that it is possible to have a principled foundations for semantic tooling uh, that everyone in the community could use. Uh, we developed this in the open, and uh, we are confident uh, that these foundations will enable new things that haven't been possible before, at least outside the IDE. So it would be able to understand code better, to do better code reviews, and to evolve your code bases. Uh, we propose that we use a Scala meta and the semantic DB to extract information from the Scala compiler, and then uh, to index this information, potentially using Kite. It shows really a lot of promise. And then finally, to integrate with tools uh, that use on top of either schema in order to deliver scalable solutions. Uh, at the moment, uh, we have a draft spec for semantic DBs. Well, I mentioned the protobuf schema, right? And uh, we also have a technology preview of the compiler plugin as part of the Scala Meta 1.8 release that produces semantic DBs. And uh, while it's a technology preview, it's not just a prototype because it's been out there for a couple months and uh, it's also used in Scala fix. So it, it successfully compiles the Scala community build for one, something that Olaf experimented with recently. It supports the two major Scala versions, 2.11 and 2.12, and uh, there's an ongoing support uh, project to support Dotty to convert uh, tasty uh, format into semantic DB. Also, uh, 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 Stu hacked uh, the implementation integration for Scala Meta and Kite. And as Stu mentioned, this uh, is hopefully going to be open source soon. All right, uh, briefly going through the future work. Uh, first of all, we have our own code search, something that we mentioned before, uh, better than grab, faster than grab, and would be nice to enrich it with uh, semantic info. Also, for code reviews, we use Fabricator internally. It would be great to get this hooked up because the C tags are quite easy to produce. Also, the collaboration with Scalafix has been really promising and we definitely need uh, to do more of that to support more rewrites because we can immediately see how this is useful for us. And also for the entire community, of course, because Scalafix is also open source thanks to the work of Scala Center. Also, the two promising technologies, uh, Tasty, this is the interchange format uh, in Dadi, where they save uh, typed abstract syntax trees to disk, basically an improved version, a more fat version of uh, the semantic DB. So at the moment, Tasty is not supported by Scala C, so the, there's uh, gonna be, well, there may be an ongoing project, uh, together with Lightband, I presume, uh, to support Tasty in Scala C, but until it's there, uh, we'll be able to use a semantic DB to achieve similar things. And finally, uh, Stu mentioned source graph and the language server protocol. There's some promise there. 
All right, and I would like to wrap up our talk, and I uh, would like to thank Olaf. We mentioned uh, him and uh, his creation a couple of times. So Scalafix is awesome. Uh, it was really cool to battle test semantic DB to make sure it works well. I uh, would also like to uh, thank Fengun from the uh, from EPFL from Martin's lab, uh, who do, who works on integration between Dodi and Scalafix. Also, and as I mentioned, Benji Weinberger. Um, basically had talked about his pet project for going on two years, uh, which was essentially um, indexing all of Maven Central with, with Kite. So very interesting potential project. Um, knew a lot about it, finally clicked for us. We also like to thank everyone else who's, who's worked on any of the open source projects that are involved here. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, quick pitch, Twitter is definitely hiring. We are one of the largest scholar shops in the world. Um, we're doing what we think is pretty exciting research here um, and implementation. Uh, the build team in particular is where both of us reside. Um, uh, I'm about 25% on this project. I hope to be back on it fairly soon um, because we're currently working on distributed compilation and testing. Um, lots of code, lots of code is flowing around at Twitter. Um, we already do about the minimum amount of building that we can. Uh, so now it's time to start distributing that um, and executing it in parallel on clusters. Um, semantic indexing, IDE integration, uh, we do a lot more than just build file wrangling. So exciting stuff to do. Does anyone have any questions? So I, I guess one of the, going right back to the, the monorepo stuff at the beginning, one of, mm. one, of, one of the exciting things about monorepos is obviously that you can uh, update multiple, maybe logically independent projects uh, atomically, you can also branch things uh, mm -hmm. kind of atomically. Mm -hmm. I guess my question is, have you experimented with or have you considered uh, including the Scala compiler and library in that mix? Uh, have we considered building the Scala compiler in our repo? Yes. Is, is, so in, inclu source, including it in yeah. the entire universe of yeah. stuff that you, yeah. might, you might fork and modify. Yeah. Uh, I can say that there's prior art. We have not considered that. Um, if we see a juicy enough project, that, that could definitely be a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, there's prior art. Uh, Google essentially imports everything as source. You know, if they see an open source project, they import it and then have some, some sync process. So. Not to do too much, hey, Google did it, it's bound to work, because um, <laughs> we had enough of that in the talk. Uh, there, is, there is prior art. And that would certainly allow you to iterate very quickly on, the, on compiler updates and sandbox it against everything, uh, the unit test pass, merge it. So, and is while the mic is traveling, I can just say, you know, we're still in a situation where um, we can bump the Scala version with you know, a one-line change in our repo for Going on, going on 10 million lines of Scala code. So it's uh, we have the community build internally as well. Hello. So a question to Eugene regarding the semantic DB. Uh, yes. So what about uh, the thing as recursive implicits? I think uh, like in an example we shown that uh, as a part of Scala C. Uh, compiler uh, using the semantic DB flag, you actually generate this uh, semantic DB database files, and here's like can build from implicit. What if this implicit will be dependent on another implicit or recursive implicit, such as like shapeless love to do? All right, uh, that's a great question. Uh, in particular, support for sugars, it's uh, been just added in the recent release, uh, and uh, uh, we're experimenting with the approaches. But basically, at the moment, you will see the fully expanded code. So if you have a multiple implicit lookup, so if this can build from, if it were to depend on other implicits, you would see everything in that line. Okay. That's how it works. At the and moment. the second question, what if the compilation will fail? Would I still uh, have this fancy list of everything here? All right, uh, also cool, how do we deal with errors? Um, uh, at the moment, you will get semantic DBs uh, for all the files that have been compiled successfully. At least uh, that's the state of my prototype internally. Probably we shipped it in 1.8, so that, that was the idea. But in principle, we could do an even better job. Basically, we really depend on Scala C and its error handling functionality. 
So if, for instance, Scala C would be able to, you know, mark given trees, well, given code, well, fragments of your program that don't compile, if it were to mark them somehow and then proceed compilation to, so, so that it allows our compiler plugin to still data mine this incomplete information, that would be awesome. But at the moment, to the best of my knowledge, that's not possible. It would be interesting to experiment. Okay. With. Thank you. Hey, sir. Uh, so you have like uh, position numbers, one and five, one and five. What about like line number or something like? If you have multiple of those. Okay. All right. Uh, so since uh, it's a data schema, we want to store as little information as possible in order to you know load it later on. And these offsets, they're necessary to unambiguously identify, well, given ranges in the program. And then after we have them, actually Scala Meta provides a richer API. So after we load this thing into the Scala Meta data model, we can get lines, line numbers, columns, and so on and so forth, whatever you really expect. All right. Anything else you guys would like to know? Yeah, I mean, quickly, as a consumer of the API, I was consuming an AST, walking through it, um, and then able to refer to this information via methods on the AST that were implicitly added that kind of refer to additional information. Um, so the tree ends up annotated with a whole bunch of additional, additional data um, yeah, so parsed from this file. You're not dealing, you're generally not dealing with it in the flat format. In fact, it, does, it never really exists in the flat format aside from this demo app. So quite simple question. Um, those lines are in the compiled file, right? It's like it doesn't refer to some source code files. It's already Java C or uh, like. No, compiled. this is in the source. That, those are so those are character <laughs> positions in the input source file. So if you take um, any one of those character ranges and just highlight it in the file, you'll see that this is that that string yeah, of text. That's right. So basically this refers to the original file text. And this is something that uh, Olaf and I uh, were going back and forth on, uh, whether to include the source code of the file into the semantic DB or not. So we ended up including the sources so that you can unambiguously you know, parse them and then apply the semantic info. So it's not, not a line number, but a, a simple position kind of. Yeah, actually, so this uh, 28 uh -huh. to 33 here, 28th character to cool. the 33rd. Oh, mouse is an hour. <laughs>